Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight to learn more about the college selection and application process. I wanted to start this evening's presentation by encouraging you to do some homework. I think it's really important that everyone who engages in the process of selecting a college is aware not only of some of the nuts and bolts aspect of the process, but also some of the overarching concerns as well. Um, I actually do a lot of reading on the uh, idea of college admissions, and I do have a couple of recommendations for you. Again, just so that you're aware of all the parameters that go into the selection of an applicant on the college's side. Uh, also, uh, for most people, college is the second largest investment that you will make in your lifetime, and so I think it's really important for you to be an educated consumer. Um, I pulled excellent sheep off my shelf this morning and I chuckled to myself because it was published in 2014, which to me feels like yesterday. But in fact, uh, a lot has changed in college admissions since 2014, and a lot of that is driven by the uh, fact that many, many schools are test optional, and an, an increasingly large number of schools are test blind, which means that they won't look at test scores at all, even if you submit them. And that's important. We'll talk about that in some more detail as this evening's presentation progresses. But um, excellent sheep, if you were interested in doing some reading, really would give you more of the history of education and higher education admissions in America. This one is very interesting, who gets in and why, because the author actually spent a year inside four college admissions offices. If you can notice, I've got a lot of things highlighted in this book. Um, I think it really makes clear that there are three elements to an applicant's process through the admissions office. First is through the admissions rep then there's financial aid, and then there's what's called enrollment management. And in fact, a student can be accepted or not accepted and kind of bounce around between those three offices, and this book really highlights how that works. This one is extremely important. It's called The Price You Pay for College. It's written by a gentleman named Ron Lieber, and uh, he's actually running a presentation coming up as well. Um, We'll share that information with you as we get it. But he's really focused on the fact that there's not a lot of transparency when it comes to the financial aid process. Uh, as you'll learn, there are two streams of money. One of them is merit-based aid. The other one is need-based aid. But when it comes to the offer that you get finally from the college, it's very hard to tease out which is coming from which pool. And so basically he's advocating here to remove those uh, barriers and make the process more transparent in terms of how colleges are allocating dollars to your children. So um, I encourage you to consider these ideas, um, especially the idea of how financial aid might or might not play a role in selecting a college for your child. And as always, um, you know, we are here in the College Placement Office to help, so if you have any questions about any of the titles I've mentioned or uh, anything related to college admissions, please let us know. I'd li now like to turn it over to Ms. Ronan. Thank you, Mrs. Marconi. Good evening, juniors. I want to just talk to you first about the packet that you received in your homeroom today. Inside that packet is valuable information. Um, a lot of the stuff we talk about tonight in our presentation will also be in the different papers and booklets and things like that that you got in that folder this morning. If you are absent today, make sure that you come to the College Placement Office so you can pick up your folder as soon as you get back to school. And I want to just remind you that, because um, later on, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Marconi is going to talk about logging on to Naviance. So you did log into Naviance in your college, uh, your computer class last year. So um, that's how you can get onto your system. If you're having any issues getting back on, you can always come to the College Placement Office. Or if you are a transfer student, please come to the College Placement Office, and we'll be happy to help you out getting onto Naviance so you can do your searches. OK, so let me go to our presentation now. And first focus would be, what should you be doing now? So. You're not applying to colleges this year. 
So what should you be doing now? First of all, and this is really, really important, you do want to keep your grades as high as possible. Colleges will look at all of your grades, but if you have really strong junior year grades, that can be a very big bonus when they're looking at you to figure out if you can get into that college. So keeping your grades as high as possible not only shows that you are motivated and really ready for college level work, it also gets your three year average to be as high as possible as well. Next, cultivate relationships with teachers so they know you when you ask for letters of recommendation. So later on this year, you will be asking three teachers if they would be willing to write a letter of recommendation for you. And two of those teachers will be chosen. And if you only have really good grades in the class, but the teacher never heard your voice, it, it does make it a little bit tougher for teachers to write really good letters when that happens. So the more that they know you and you as a person and your personality, the better their letter can be for you. So if you have people that you think you might ask later in the year whether they would be willing to write a letter for you or not, those are the classes where maybe you start talking a little bit more, or if you already had the teacher, maybe you stop by their classroom to say hi, see how they're doing, just so they get a little bit of a sense of your personality in addition to the academic accomplishments that you had. Next thing you should really think about is preparing for standardized tests. So doing your test prep, both in college prep and also at home, uh, the more that you prepare for the test, the easier they're going to be. So that's something you should definitely be doing at this point. And you should start researching colleges. And we'll talk later in this presentation about how you can use Naviance to do that. Next, I want to just focus on test scores. So colleges will accept both the SAT and ACT scores if they are a school that needs test scores. Many colleges are test optional right now, meaning that you can send your scores if you would like to, but you don't necessarily have to if you're not happy with what scores you received. And some colleges are test blind. So if a school is test blind, so for example, the California schools or um, we have a uh, Catholic university has been test blind, that means that they're not going to look at the scores at all. So if a school is test blind, you're not going to send your scores ever to them. But if they're test optional and you have really good scores, that's something that you could really consider trying to send to those colleges. So let's talk about the ACT exam. ACT exam, if you wish to take it, is going to be on Saturday, April 13th, and it's going to be hosted at Kellenberg Memorial High School. You would want to register for this test if you plan to take it at Kellenberg by March 8th. That's the deadline for registration and you would register on the ACT student website. When you register, you would use the test center code, which is 251100, and that's Kellenberg's test center code. Now, just one thing, okay? We're gonna talk about some dates here. It's not that we will not send this information out later. We just want you to have a scope of the year and what's coming up. Uh, so this information will be sent out in an email much closer to the date. If you're reading your emails, anything from our college placement office, especially if you get any college news notes from me, I've already sent out one this year to juniors, uh, please read through those so that you know what's going on. Next up, let's take a look at the SAT test date. So for the SAT, that exam is offered during the school day on March 20th. So you just come to school and take the test instead of doing your classes. For that one, you would want to register on the Kellenberg website. There will be a registration link for that. And that would be by mid-February. Again, we're going to send out an email with that information, so there's no need to um, try to memorize that information right now. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about test optional and what that means, because a lot of people think, well, why would I even take the SAT or ACT to begin with? First of all, until you take the test, you have no idea how you would do on it. And if you do really well, even if a school is test optional, they'll look at the test scores. So sometimes that can be a really favorable part of your application. And I want to just point out something here. So on your screen right now, this is something that I received from Texas Tech University. Of course, most of you are not going to be looking at Texas for your schools, but some of you might. Uh, but I just like how they presented it here because it proves the point of even if a school says that they're test optional, sometimes they do look at test scores for other things like scholarships 
or if there are certain programs like nursing or pre-med, they might ask that you submit scores. And you won't really know that until you're applying next year. So you can see here on the screen, uh, for Texas Tech, they say that they have a test optional option, but if you look at the GPA of a 4.0 to 3.96, if you have a 34 to 36 ACT score or a 1500 to 1600, you can get $9,000 per year. Whereas if we look all the way down at the bottom, test optional would be $4,000 per year. And even an, an SAT score of 1100 could get you $5,000 per year scholarship money for that school. So at this school, even though they're saying that you can go test optional, they will actually change your scholarship money depending on what test scores you send. So that's something you just want to keep in mind when you're making that decision. So what we always say is take one SAT and one ACT, and we offer both of those at Kellenberg in the spring, and then see how you do on them. I wouldn't retake both of them multiple times because that's going to make you a little bit crazy. But whichever one you do best on and converts to higher on the other test, and you can just do a conversion on, you know, you just go to Google and say like SAT to ACT conversion chart, and you look at your scores and see what it converts to. So whichever one's higher on the other scale, that's the one that I would maybe take one more time again in the fall and see what your scores look like. After you have your scores, then you can decide, do I want to go test optional, do I not? So it's something that you really want to think about taking the test, even though you might not send them. Uh, but test optional doesn't mean let's not take the tests at all. So uh, I will see you in a little bit, but uh, I first want to introduce to you Mrs. Stefan, who's going to talk to you about prep for the rep. Mrs. Stefan? Thank you, Ms. Ronan. At Kellenberg, I serve as the link between the high school and the admission offices of colleges and university. It's my goal to help students find a college that's a perfect fit for them. The best way to do that is by visiting a college campus. You will want to start planning your college tours early. The best time to visit is during a holiday break, weekends, or the summer before your senior year. There are a few things to keep in mind when visiting. Once on campus, you will receive a significant amount of useful information. I recommend bringing a notepad to write down key facts, taking photos of the campus to reference later. You'll be surprised how quickly you will forget an institution. Here are a few things to remember before you arrive on campus. Dress appropriately, arrive on time, and avoid being on your cell phone. To make the most of your visit, you want to ask the right questions, and it's a good idea to include questions that you cannot find online. You'll most likely remember a fun fact about the institution over a statistic. Some examples are, what is your favorite place to eat on campus, what's a tradition the university has, and what do you like to do on the weekends? When you're touring a campus, it's a great idea to stop a current student and ask them about their experience or why they decided to attend that institution. Once your tour has concluded, you should follow up with the college representative from our area. Be sure to ask for their business card and send an email or a personal thank you note. An example of a sample email to the college representative is on your screen. This will demonstrate interest and allow you to continue that conversation about the institution. Always include your full name, high school, graduation year, and something that you enjoyed from your visit. In your blue folder, you will find a pros and cons list to help you determine what you might be looking for in an institution. Before you go on your college visit, the College Placement Office will ask you to fill out a college visitation request form. Please go to the Kellenberg website, head to the Parents tab, and on that page you will find a big blue button that says Parent Portal, which will lead you to PowerSchool. On PowerSchool, you'll be able to access the College Visitation Request Form. The form must be filled out by a parent and handed into the College Placement Office no later than two days before your visit. Some days during the school year are not acceptable to miss, such as trimester exams. You will also want to ask the college for an official letter when you show up to the school. You will bring that letter to the College Placement Office the following day. Both the form and proof that you attended the college visit are required for an absence to be excused. Now let's shift our focus to demonstrated interest. Demonstrated interest is when a student expresses interest in a particular institution. 
This includes, but not limited to a campus visit, an email, or any interaction that you've had with the institution that makes you excited about their school. Requesting an interview is also another great idea to show your interest. If you take a look in your blue folder, you will see a list of different interview questions. Fun fact, our College Placement Office is now on social media, which will be able to provide you more useful information and other resources, including the, throughout the college process. You can follow our office on Instagram at KMHS underscore College Connection. Happy touring, and now I'm going to reintroduce Ms. Ronan. Thank you, Mrs. Stefan. So um, what I want to talk to you now about is military academies and ROTC. Now, this might not apply to all of you, but it is good information to know just in case this is something you're thinking about. This is specifically for the US military academies that I'm referring to, and that would be West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, and the Coast Guard Academy. These schools, when you go to apply to them, uh, first of all, the application part starts a little bit earlier, but they're a little bit more involved than college applications. So this is something that you want to think about. Would any of these schools be one that you might want to apply to next year? Because there are certain things you want to take into account if you're going to do that. ROTC is Reserve Officer Training Corps, and that is in different branches of the military, like Navy and Army and Air Force. And this would be offered at some colleges. And what happens with ROTC is you go to a regular college, but you have a little bit extra coursework to train you in the military training while you're there. So you might have maybe on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, you go and you have PT sessions where you're running and doing different calisthenics. Um, you would definitely have some sort of military science courses that you would take in addition to the regular coursework you have at college. But it would be a little bit different than the academies because at the academies you would be wearing your uniform the whole time, whereas at ROTC programs you're going to a regular college, maybe wearing your jeans and t-shirt to class, and then there are certain times when you would uh, do your military uh, part of your education. If you think that this is something that you're interested in, you can use Naviance to help you figure out which colleges have ROTC programs. If you are thinking about applying to any of the academies, the process for that would start in March of this school year for places like West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy. So uh, if this is something you're interested in, once we hit March 1st, you would want to start your pre-application at that time. For both the academies and also for ROTC, something to keep in mind when you're asking the teachers for letters of recommendation, you should ask your junior math teacher and your junior English teacher for recommendation letters because those are things that are required by those academies and also from ROTC. For West Point, they will also ask you to provide a science teacher, a junior science teacher letter, so you would want that person to be your third person. Let's take a look next at NCAA um, for our different athletes. So with our college sports, uh, something that I want to mention to you, something that we have here at Kellenberg, which is kind of unique and a really helpful part, especially if you think you might want to not only play a sport in college, but that you're good enough to be a recruited athlete. So Mrs. Jennifer Strauss is our NCAA coordinator. And if you think that you are going to play a sport in college or are already currently being recruited, it would be really good to reach out to her and set up an appointment with her so that you can ask her your questions and use her guidance to help you through this process. Her email is kind of the same way that all Kellenberg teachers have, so it's going to be Mrs. Strauss at Kellenberg.org. Don't forget, it's two, like MRS and then the S for Strauss. And Strauss also ends with two S's. So uh, Mrs. Strauss at Kellenberg.org is a good way to reach out to her. And uh, what would also be something good to do at this point is to register on the NCAA Eligibility Center. Now, there, the website for that is on your screen at this time. But under Athletics, where I'm going to talk about how you can find more information um, that Mrs. Strauss has put on our website, there also is a link to the Eligibility Center as well. So let's talk about signing up for the NCAA newsletter and then important information that is already on the Kellenberg website. So Mrs. Strauss, every once in a while, maybe like once a month or once every two months or so, will send out an NCAA newsletter with 
important information to help you through the recruiting process um, and just things that you should be doing at that time and other things that could be really, really helpful if you are looking to maybe be a college athlete. So um, to sign up for the newsletter, you're going to go to the Kellenberg website, www.kellenberg.org, and then you're going to click on Athletics. Under Athletics, one of the options is NCAA Information, so you're going to choose that. And then you're going to scroll to the bottom of that page, and you'll see that there's a place where you can put in your information to sign up for the newsletter. On that page, there's also many other resources that would be very helpful for any student athlete who is looking to compete in college. So it does have the link to the NCAA website and other things that could be really, really helpful. And we're really lucky and fortunate to have Mrs. Strauss in this role because not only does, was she a college athlete herself, she also coaches uh, our, one of our volleyball teams here, and she was a college coach. In addition to that, she's currently part of the NCAA East Coast Advisory Group, um, so she has really good insight into what NCAA is thinking at this time and always loves to share that with our students. So take advantage of that if you are an athlete who's looking to potentially play in college. So next up, um, we're going to talk about searching for colleges. So I'm going to turn it back to Mrs. Marconi, who's going to go through different things to think about as you're searching for colleges, and also how you can use Naviant to help you in your college search. Mrs. Marconi? Thank you, Ms. Ronan. Uh, I wanted to take you this evening through how to do a search, do a nuts and bolts review of how to actually use a tool that we have called Naviance to help you either expand or limit some of the colleges that you might be thinking about. So we're going to walk through, uh, first of all, how to get to Naviance, okay? You're going to go to the Kellenberg website, and on the Kellenberg website, navigate over to the Guidance tab. I want to hover there for a moment because I want you to see that we have a couple of different options there. One of them is College Placement for Students. Another is College Placement for Parents. That's where you might want to go to find out some more information about, for example, the books I mentioned or financial aid or other topics relevant to you as parents. So let's go on this College Placement for Students page. You'll notice right away that it's got a host of really important information, including a bunch of how-to PowerPoints, how to apply to college, how to fill out the Common App, which is a video. So anytime you get stuck down the road when you get to that point, don't hesitate to check on the website first to find out if you um, have a question about how to complete a task. All right, so to no log into Naviance, you're going to click on Naviance Login, and it will bring you to this page. Now, I'm already logged in, so you're seeing my page, and I want to focus right now on the Colleges tab, okay? We need to look at things like how to conduct a search. If you navigate over to the left here, you'll see this tab called Find Your Fit. We have a Supermatch College search. We have a College Match. We have lots of things there that can help you look up, for example, a geographic location, a admissions rate, a uh, size of the school, private school, public school, there are many factors that you might want to consider when conducting a search. And so if you're not familiar with schools, then you could certainly use this. You can select schools off of those matches, and they'll come on your colleges I'm applying to, uh, colleges I'm thinking about list, excuse me. You'll see that I already have this pre-populated. I want to walk through why we chose these schools, okay? We have Adelphi because it's local. We have Fairfield, well, partially because I went there, so I know a thing or two about it, but also because it's a suburban campus, it's a smallish to medium-sized school, it's a Jesuit college, which means that they have a specific charism, just the way that the Marianists have their charism. And if, you're, if you like Fairfield, then you might be looking at schools like Loyola or Scranton or College of the Holy Cross. 
We included, included a CUNY school on this list because um, even though we live in Nassau County, we're able to um, get the rate, the tuition rate of a city resident and CUNY schools are extraordinarily inexpensive. So that would be something to have on there as a good option for something that's affordable. We added Malloy University, uh, partially because Malloy is uh, an excellent school for nursing as well as other programs, but we do have a large number of students who apply there, particularly to their nursing program. Penn State is interesting because it's a large state university. We all know the Nittany Lions and painting your face and all that stuff. But what's interesting about it is that Penn State asks you to apply to the state university system and then they decide your campus. So you may not end up on main campus if you apply to Penn State. On the other hand, in New York, you could apply to separately SUNY Stony Brook, SUNY Binghamton, and SUNY Farmingdale. Those are state universities in New York. In order to have a SUNY on our list, we included Albany, and we included Villanova because, again, it's a very popular school with Kellenberg students. It's a private school. It's a Catholic school, but it's not a Jesuit school. Okay, so for, let's click on Adelphi and see what kind of information we can garner from this home page. Adelphi, as you can see, has an average net price of $26,732. Having said that, that's for a family income between zero and $30,000. So if your family income is above $110,000, you want to click that um, drop down. More about cost and aid will give you some information about their um, costs and you'll get much more information about specifics including things like annual room and board. If I go, go over here to the acceptance rate, you'll see that Adelphi has a 74% acceptance rate and a graduation rate in four years of 60%. That's a metric that you can use to apply, um, compare Adelphi to some other universities, okay? If we scroll down, you'll see some quick facts, one of which is that it is a private school, undergraduate enrollment of just over 5,000, which puts it in the medium-ish range, and the average student-to-faculty ratio is 12 to 1. It's obviously in a suburban location, and they offer degrees through a doctoral degree. So that is our landing page. If I click on Fairfield, we can see those same um, pieces of information. Okay, we'll put that up to the 110,000 or greater income, and you'll see the net price goes way up. Their graduation rate is 78%, their acceptance rate is 60%. But for Fairfield, I wanna focus on the Studies tab. They also have a 12 to 1 student to faculty ratio, class size of 21. Their student retention rate is 90%, which if you compare that to other universities, you'll see is really quite high. And then this is something of significant importance to most people, particularly given the financial investment, the job placement rate. 77% of Students who graduate from Fairfield have a job, those who are seeking graduation have a job within six months. Top areas of study are noted here. And then down here, you'll see a list of all their possible majors and minors. Okay, so they have lots of things in the humanities, which isn't surprising given that it's a Jesuit school. They do have an engineering school, which was recently launched. And they also have a considerable number of majors in the health sciences field. Uh, I was actually up there recently, and I know they have a brand new nursing building. Okay, so that's Fairfield. Going back, again, we'll use CUNY Hunter for some other data. Let's click on student life now. This tab will show you a lot of information about the makeup of the campus. You'll see that in terms of gender, especially, 
women make up 65% of CUNY Hunter's undergraduate enrollment. Now, for CUNY Hunter, it may not you know, make a big difference because it's located in the city, but if you were on a suburban campus, you might really pay attention to that. And we've seen over the past few years uh, for schools where there's a heavy enrollment of females, sometimes the boys are more likely to get accepted or even get a little bit more in terms of their scholarship money. So sometimes it's an important thing to look at that breakdown. You'll also notice at CUNY Hunter that most of the students on campus are under the age of 24. Uh, residency status obviously is going to heavily favor in-state because it's a city university and there's 99% of the students there are domestic. You'll see that there's limited housing for um, CUNY Hunter, as one might imagine. And if you scroll down here, you'll see all of the various um, student organizations and services on campus not going to be the same amount of um, opportunities there as you might in a larger or private school. Okay, so now let's pop into, um, we'll use next SUNY Albany. For SUNY Albany, I'm going to click on this fourth tab, the admissions tab. You'll notice that on this tab, you have the acceptance rate, you'll have the deadlines, and you'll have important policies. For example, they do not use early decision at uh, SUNY Albany. Early decision, which will be discussed again in a later presentation, is a binding commitment. You can only apply to one school early decision, and if you are accepted, you are contractually obligated to attend the school. On the other hand, it can enhance your chances for admission, but I would recommend that if you're even thinking down the road about doing early decision, you have a long conversation with your college placement counselor. You'll notice here that we have a very nicely laid out bar graph of the application history of Kellenberg Memorial students. You can slide this over. We have data reaching back all the way until 2015. And this breaks down how many applied, how many were accepted, and then ultimately how many enrolled. You'll notice that we were running strong at about four students enrolled per year until 2018 when we jumped up to 10 enrolled. Then you see a little bit of a dip in the uh, number of applicants to SUNY schools post-COVID. But last year in 2023, there were a very significant number of applicants from Kellenberg to SUNY Albany. Of the 85 who applied, 50 were accepted. Now, if we use this scattergram to give us a different view of this bar graph, you'll notice some things that are important. For example, if your check mark, which indicates that a student was accepted, if it has a box around it, that means that the student did early action. Early action is non-binding, and you can apply to many schools non uh, early action. It's not the same as early decision. You'll also notice that there are some students in the blue who used regular decision but were waitlisted. That means that uh, the student applied, no decision was rendered really, they were put on a wait list, and if someone chose not to attend SUNY Albany and they had an extra slot, they would go to students who are on the wait list. And then the red X's are students who were not accepted. You'll notice this one anomaly up here, this student who had a GPA of 92.3 and an SAT score of 1290. You might be wondering what accounts for that. The answer is, who knows? It could be any number of factors. Perhaps that student didn't demonstrate any interest in SUNY Albany, and the admissions department felt that they were not likely to attend the school, that they had just applied as a sort of backup school. Um, if you do not show any demonstrated interest to your colleges, there's a chance that they will either uh, waitlist you or outright not accept you. What does demonstrated interest mean? 
It can mean visiting the campus. It can mean speaking to the rep when the reps are on campus or at a local college fair. It can also mean opening email or clicking on links that are embedded in the email. So if there's a school on your list, and I know that students become inundated with email from colleges, but if it's a college that you're kind of interested in, and if you think that there's some chance you may not be able to visit, it's a good idea to click on those emails and then subsequently click on any links so that they can track your interest. All right, now let's go back to a school like Villanova. I'm going to use Villanova to highlight the costs of the university. You'll see that the average cost, um, the average grant amount, excuse me, is $32,435. Um, the average net price we're going to want to change and add um, quite a bit of money onto what the average net price is for um, Villanova. You'll look down here and you'll see that they have their tuition and fees, they have uh, room and board, they have the tuition per credit hour, so you can break it down um, in a very granular way. But at the end of the day, Villanova is a um, rather expensive university. If I come over to this admissions tab, you'll see, as I mentioned before, that it's extremely popular. Although their acceptance rate of Kellenberg students is sometimes hard to define. You'll notice here that there's large amounts of green check marks mixed in with large amounts of wait lists overlaid by students who are not accepted. So for a school like this, I would really kind of rely on the bar graphs because the um, scattergram does not include the time of um, when these applicants were either accepted, waitlisted, or not accepted. I suspect that um, you'll notice, as I did, that some impact was felt after the Villanova basketball team won a couple of NCAA titles. Um, I, even I was watching those basketball games thinking, well, I wish I could go to Villanova, go back to school. Um, again, notice some important policies here on the um, admissions tab, and these are things that will tell you a lot, such as they don't offer early action, they offer early decision, um, and it tells you their acceptance rate. If you are interested in something like, for example, ROTC, which is a way of um, engaging in the promise of military service after college, and you do your training during college, and you do receive scholarship for that, you can go down here to the student organizations and services part of student life, okay? And again, let's just take a peek at this. You'll notice that the male to female ratio is much closer at Villanova than it was um, at CUNY. And the residency is also quite different. 80% of Villanova students are not from Pennsylvania. 2% are international students. Villanova has a vibrant um, student life on its campus. So you'll see that there's lots of organizations analogous to Kellenberg clubs. You'll see a host of athletic options and whether or not they offer it at the varsity club or intramural level. You'll notice that there's a tab here for Greek life. Maybe that's something that you're interested in. There are eight fraternities and nine sororities. ROTC is going to indicate whether they offer ROTC on their campus and which service um, branches are available. Okay, so there's lots of information to be discovered. Uh, you'll definitely want to, as I said, pay attention to things like the net price calculator, which can be found on each uh, college's website. And you'll definitely want to keep an eye on that uh, price based on your income level. Again, I cannot encourage you strongly enough to 
read the college news notes that we send home. They are replete with information, including information about scholarships that maybe uh, your child is eligible for, important due dates, to-do lists, schools that are visiting Kellenberg. Um, really, college news notes are a crucial part of the school um, family partnership. I strongly encourage you to follow us on Instagram. It's a great way when you're scrolling, uh, you know, during the day to keep on top of what's going on in the college placement office, including, as I said, due dates or maybe the schools that are visiting on any given day. And please attend any of the programming that we're offering. Uh, the landscape of college admissions is changing almost on a daily basis, and it's important for you, even if you've been through the process before, to make sure that you're keeping up to date with um, our processes and procedures, okay? So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to working with you through your child's college journey. Thank you.